I'm really excited about our panel and about all the sisters here. This is absolutely fantastic. We've fought for a couple of years to get the Kennedy inquiry into SSA. The women's group, um, Me To You, which is um, an amazing and growing body of sisters who are not going to stop until we have justice in the trade union movement and make it strong and fit, fit to fight for the future that, you know, that we need and can make. Um, but none of this would have happened without um, collaboration and in, in particular without um, the bravery of my sister Claire Laycock who broke the NDA. Yesterday was International Women's Day and the theme of it this year was equity, so equity as well as equality. Legislation says that we are equal to men. Equity means that we have the things we need to bring about that equality. So case in point being safe, dignified working environments, which many of us women working in the trade union movement don't have. Um, and the double bind is the fact that we are or have been working for people who demand the highest, of, highest standards of treatment for their members in workplaces while perpetrating sexual violence and harassment against their own employees. Um, I, I've, I've been through all of those things in both of the trade unions that I work for, the GMB and the TSSA. Um, and by the time I was on my way out of a job for the second time um, for, the, for, for those reasons, I knew that I had to do something, that something had to give. So. The stars seemed to align in a strange way. I'd met people at TSSA that I could work with and take things forward with, people who always wanted to do something. We all met Fliss, so the prospect of doing a video came about. So once I was safely away from TSSA, I'd signed my NDA and I knew that making the video would involve breaking the NDA, so then I made the decision to do that. Um, for, for different reasons. One was to get justice, to try to get justice for myself and for other people. I, I knew that it was a risk, I knew that justice wasn't guaranteed, but also I knew that I had to do it to enable myself to move on so I could look myself in the, in the face and know that I'd done everything that I could possibly do in order to try to change things before I moved on from the movement for good, which I've now done. After the video went out, TSSA took myself and Real News to court to try to get the video injuncted. After a week was up, the judge lifted that injunction and I was able to speak again. So they went to court and lost. That was the first sense of justice that we all felt. Um, following that, there was an inquiry into the culture and the behaviour and all of the things that had happened at the TSSA, which was carried out by Helena Kennedy. She delivered her report about three weeks ago now and it was absolutely damning up and down of the senior management team and the culture of the union and the damage that has been done. So since then, um, the people deemed to have done the most damage in the report have been suspended or dismissed on the grounds of gross misconduct. Uh, there's a new administration in place and people are beginning the work of trying to right the wrongs and build the union back up. Um, however, there's a prospect, there's the prospect of a merger with the GMB, which following Monaghan had their own, um, they had their own measures to put in place in, in order to put their own house in order. As far as I'm aware, speaking to sisters within GMB and former employees, the GMB still, still isn't reformed. So for one group of perpetrators to merge potentially with another isn't fair on members and it isn't fair on women. So while I believe that there are a lot of people in both unions that mean the best and want reform, the fight goes on to enable those people to do that. It, is, it isn't finished, it's in fact just the beginning. Um, I found out yesterday that Manuel Cortez and Luke Chester, two of the people that were sacked on the grounds of gross misconduct from, from TSSA following the report, they are both appealing against their dismissals. So um, that was difficult to, to hear, but it, it demonstrates to me the level of, the level of delusion and the level of entitlement and 
the complete lack of understanding and self-awareness that they have about the things that they did. To finish, um, I want to say that it's okay to be unlikable. It's okay in, in terms of not being a, a good woman, not being a good girl, not keeping quiet. It's all right to speak out. It's all right to tell the truth. And it's all right to stand up for yourself and other people. It's really okay. President and the treasurer stood down the day the report came out. The day the report came out, um, and then uh, another those two members of staff, the general secretary, and the organizer, uh, the uh, organizing director, and then three more stood down. Um, and we still don't feel that that is is far enough. I'm so incredibly proud of Claire, Maggie, and the TSSA survivors that have come forward through this most recent investigation, and the sisters from GMB that did so prior to this. I don't think it can be underestimated how difficult that is to come out and speak about your employer, your trade union, the people that many of our members look up to and they really are leading the way now for the rest of us in the movement um, to come forward. And I was kicking myself at five o'clock this morning when I woke up thinking about all sorts and everything again. That's something that I quite often do as a woman in the movement. When I spoke yesterday um, on motion one, what I should have asked whilst Paul was sat there was, and I'm going to ask sisters now, how many of you in the room have experienced sexual harassment, violence, misogyny in your workplace? <laughs> Keep your hands up if you've experienced it in the trade union movement and that doesn't necessarily need to be your own. <clears throat> the figures just say themselves, don't they? Um, and I wish that I'd have thought about this yesterday when I did the motion because there would have been far more hands up in that room, I know. I want to give my solidarity to every single sister that just raised their hand because to go through that in a movement that champions safety, equality, inclusivity and everything else that the trade union movement does is bloody disgraceful, isn't it, in 2023? Um, and I also want you to know that we believe you, Me to you believes you, we're here for you and we will support you. Um, we have regular meetings, you can come, we can talk about what next steps we need to do. But as a sister in the position of General Secretary in the trade union movement, you can always reach out to me. We had Women's International Women's Day yesterday and I was looking through um, social media, as you do, I scroll on it quite often, I tweet every now and again. And some of the, and I, I'm going to be quite blunt here, some of the shitty comments from men in our movement at all levels, you know, from reps up to senior officials about when's this day over because I want my tea. Women can't multitask because they can't sit down and shut up. It's not good enough, is it? How do our members go to these people for support and representation? And when it's been led by the top, by perpetrators, you know, such as Manuel and others, how can we expect change? Because they're saying it's okay. Well, it's not okay. It's not okay. And it's no good, you know, coming to conferences and doing speeches and saying, yes, we've got everything sorted because we've got a report. But it, we've got to know what's actually happening as a result of that report. We need action. We need concrete action of what's going to change. Reps need to be held accountable for their inappropriate language. And if they can't change their ways, they don't deserve to be reps in our movement. Executive councils need to be doing their jobs and holding these people accountable. And just because that's never happened before doesn't mean it shouldn't happen going forwards. And, and most importantly, senior officials, leaders of our movement, need to be held accountable. They need to be reminded that they are not the trade union. Our members are. Our members pay our wages and our members deserve the dignity and respect of having a leader <coughs> that's not going to put their hands on a woman at a party and then blow and drink. Mm -hmm. yeah. We can't carry on as we are. Too many women, such as Claire, have been pushed out of our movement unfairly. They've been silenced. They've been, they've been ignored. They've been told that they're overreacting because somebody's acted inappropriately. No sister should be left thinking, nobody's believing me. Too many people turn a blind eye and it shouldn't just be down to us sisters to call it out. We, we need brothers doing the same. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. 
no union can honestly sit and say they haven't got an issue with it, including my own. I know which reps we need to deal with. I know which officials need talking to and dealing with. There's a whole outdated values, alcohol driven culture within our movement that belongs in the past. And this alcohol driven culture shouldn't be no excuse by the way. It shouldn't be a, oh well I can't remember because I had one too many to drink. Well just yeah. don't, I nearly saw just don't drink. You know, if you can't control your behaviour when you've had one too many, don't drink or don't turn up, get out of our movement. Um, we need to change the structures that enforce this power. Like I say, trade union leaders aren't the union, but many of them think that they are. And I've gone through the Monaghan and the Kennedy report with a fine tooth comb multiple times. And actually looking at them, there could be any trade union in, in the room. There could be any trade union aspects of it talking about. So we've got to change. And we can only do that by coming together, sisters. We, we're going to have to make the start. I know I mentioned about brothers have got a role to play, but we're going to have to be the ones that make that start, make that demand. If you know a sister's struggling, stand with her. Yeah. You know, there are far too many fantastic officials being driven out of our movement still even now. And we've got to change that. We've got to believe each other, listen to each other, support each other. Most importantly, empower each other. And me to you will help do that. Thank you. Help by My Silence, the campaign that um, I co-founded with uh, Professor Julian McFarlane. We've been working uh, with the Department for Education, getting non-disclosure agreements banned in higher education. And we had a voluntary pledge, which we launched in January last year. And by many weird and wonderful things that go on in Westminster, which I still don't really understand how any of it works, but it doesn't work how any of us think it works or should work, we managed to get legislation through which now bans NDAs within universities in England. Wow. Which means that about 10 million students, staff and any visiting speakers to universities are now protected. And it's not just sexual harassment, it's from discrimination, bullying, any form of behavioural misdemeanour. But obviously we have devolved sectors. And I was meeting with the Welsh um, Minister education minister and department just before I came here and I spent this very impassioned two hours telling them how you know they were going to look so bad not being signed up and blah, 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 blah. and I do tend to get on one once I start speaking and they kept trying to interrupt me but I wouldn't let them interrupt me because I thought they were going to say no anyway I got to the end of talking and then they went well, we were just trying to tell you that we're all signed up. We've got all the universities in Wales to sign up to the pledge, and we're totally on board. So anyway, that's why I'm unprepared, but um, I wanted to share it with you because the campaign that um, Julie and I run, Julie is in Canada, and I'm here, so I don't have a huge amount of people to share good news with because of the time difference. Um, one of the things listening you know, to Claire and Sarah that is very clear to me um, is that you have a huge strength being part of union movement. You have a huge strength because you are sisters. I know I'm your sister, I'm sister with every woman out there, but you are organised in a supportive group. You have each other. And as a most, you know, most employees, not all employees have that, and when I listen to you talking and I think about, you know, the huge bravery of individuals like Claire or what I, the choices that I had to make, you know, when I broke my non-disclosure agreement and with other people who I've worked with who have broken non-disclosure agreements or who are going through the most awful abuse at work. And it's not always sexual. And I think that's something to, to always hold at the top of your mind. It doesn't have to be sexual harassment to make it wrong. Um, diminishing behaviour is just as bad because that, that is the drip drip beginning of, 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 of poor behaviour and bullying. And all I ever want to do is tell everybody in those situations to speak up. Always speak up. And we live in a culture at the moment where that is considered something very brave and dangerous to do. 
and it makes me really angry, not with the people who call it to me, but, and I don't know if you feel the same, Claire, you may not, but when I am described, or when people who break an NDA, or when people who stand up and say something wrong has happened, when, people, when they are then described, their actions are described as brave, that should not be brave. Mm. That should be normal. Mm. And actually telling people it's brave makes it more frightening. It's difficult, yes, it's difficult to stand up and speak the truth. But it's not, and it shouldn't be brave. And the strength that you all have is that you can be one voice. If I was part of the union, I can tell you, I would be rabble-rousing you all and say, every single time anything happens, shout about it. Break all your NDAs. Keep shouting. They can't come after you if you do that, because they are in the wrong. And we have to reprogram the way we think about things. You know, what Claire did was incredible, but what she also has exposed and even with what's happening now, it's still exposing the fact that, okay, the super injunctions didn't work. She's not going to be ever sued for breaking that NDA because that NDA is hiding up iniquity, hiding iniquity. Anything that is hiding iniquity, anybody who is trying to keep you silent is wrong. And you have this huge power because you are a group. You are groups. You can support each other. And there are more of you than there are of those in, those in power. And I'm, I'm not, you know, advising you all to jump off a cliff, but you know what, it's not a cliff. It's a big step, mm -hmm. but it's not a cliff. Mm -hmm. These ridiculous perpetrators going to appeal, doesn't matter, let them go to appeal. They are digging their own graves, mm -hmm. allow them. This is the old guard, the last death throes of that sort of behavior. And we do have the power. We have our voices, we have to use them, we have to not be ashamed to use them. And that's what pushes change. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about um, my campaign, Can't Buy My Silence, which obviously was born out of, um, originally out of the abuse that I suffered under working for Harvey Weinstein. Um, and I think it's quite, the journey that I took is quite indicative of women who are in abusive workplaces. I had worked for him for four years, was, you know, constantly, um, well, everyone's read the stories, we know what his behaviour entailed, um, and if you didn't, just imagine the worst and you'll get there. <laughs> um, but I never spoke up about what happened to me, never occurred to me to speak up about what happened to me. When I got my own assistant, and the first time that I left her alone with him, he assaulted her then for me there was, no, there was no question, there was no choice, and I wasn't doing anything brave. I was doing something which I thought was normal, which was, which was speaking up. I was only 24 at the time, and I was pretty quickly shown that there was no, no I, that I had no, n n no weapons in this, in this battle, and that there was no hope <coughs> for us to um, f find any sort of justice. But what was more horrifying for me was that the law didn't protect us. The law actually enabled Weinstein. The law actually enables those in power. And when we talk about structural change, that's the most important thing. You've got to cut this behavior at the root. And with Can't Buy My Silence, you know, our primary thing is working at changing legislation. Because non-disclosure agreements are one of the most endemic tools used to keep people quiet, particularly women. And the tools are almost worse than the offense. Because the offence happens, and I think as Claire illustrated herself, for her to be able to move on, for her to be able to look at herself in the mirror, she had to break that NDA. Mm -hmm. Because what happens when you sign an NDA, and you don't realise this is going to happen, is that the abuse becomes worse, and you are being abused on a daily basis, because you not only have been abused and are being abused, but you cannot speak. Mm -hmm. You are being suffocated. You cannot speak to your family, you cannot speak to your friends, you cannot speak to a therapist, you cannot speak to people, to other people to warn them. So you become a perpetrator in it, in yourself, because you are protecting the perpetrator. And you don't think about that when you're in a room with your representative or your lawyer or HR who is saying, take the money, be quiet, you can move on, this makes everything clear. One thing I really want to make very clear to you, you have a right to settle. 
you have a right to keep what happened to you, your personal name, confidential, if you choose. Settlement does not mean confidentiality for the perpetrator. And any lawyer or HR or rep that tells you that is wrong. Always push back. They'll tell you you won't get your money if you don't keep quiet. That's not true. It is pure threat. When you settle, you are agreeing to not sue, to not take it any further legally. And you, are, you have the right to as much money as you can get, frankly, as compensation, because you deserve compensation. Do not equate silence with settlement or silence with compensation. That is not correct. It is not legal, but you will be told it is so. So for any of you who have come into a situation where you might be pushed into confidentiality or pushed into a non-disclosure agreement, or you know somebody who is fighting at the moment, is in some form of tribunal, Yes, tribunal isn't perfect right now, mm -hmm. and yes, your lawyer or your representative will tell you you will get more if you sign an NDA, but push back. Do not give in, because once you have signed that, then you are in a much more difficult situation, and you have to put yourself through risk like Claire did. If you don't sign, you can say whatever you want. And people, don't, people aren't wanting to go to the press when something bad happens to them. They want to be able to stop the perpetrator. They want to be able to warn others. They want to make sure it doesn't happen again. And that's what's important. People go to the press when they're gagged, because they become desperate, because they need to speak, because they are suffocating, and because they realize the injustice of what's happened. And then you have to go through the process of you know, being trolled and, and all the rest of it because you put yourself in the public domain. No woman wants to go to the press to talk about sexual assault, frankly. So if you do know anybody who is in this situation, please come to our website. We have a huge resource there on how to help, help you deal with you know, negotiating settlement. If you've signed an NDA, what you can do. Um, if you're in that situation, how you can combat that. We also have a platform for sharing safely any stories that you wish to share if you have been gagged. We ask you to make it anonymous because we want to keep you safe and we have lawyers who check it to make sure it's totally anonymised before it's published. Information gives people power and it's also hugely cathartic. Most of the people, and I'm afraid I'd say 98% of them are women who have shared their stories online say it's the first time they've ever spoken about what happened to them and the process of negotiating an NDA and being silenced by a gagging order has often been more traumatic than the initial complaint. So for them it's hugely cathartic sharing that story and it's giving us data and the power to change legislation and as I can show you we've already made one huge step one little area of society that is now protected and we're now moving on to businesses and we're going to be having we have a corporate pledge which we're going to get corporations to sign up to to push through with legislation and the first corporations we have on that are Apple and Microsoft so we're not messing about this is going to change we've changed legislation <coughs> in Canada we're changing and have changed legislation here we're changing let we've changed legislation in Ireland and it's happening in Australia. So anybody who is the wrong side of this is on the wrong side of history. And remember that when you feel afraid to speak up. Because the re I mean the reckoning is coming. This isn't this isn't just a wishful this isn't wishful thinking. So please <coughs> tool yourself up with lots of information. Don't be afraid. Stick together. Stand up and speak because it may be scary and it may jolt you when you jump that step but it's not jumping off a cliff. And ultimately, you will be on the right side of history and you are on the right side of everything. Um, I'm here from the, the Union Workers' Union, um, which was a, a, an independent trade union set up for people who work for trade unions. Um, but, but the reason why we were set up, and we shouldn't really exist really, but the reason why we were set up in the first place is because 
there is a significant number um, of staff trade unions within trade unions themselves who um, are not representing uh, members' um, interests um, and allowing this uh, toxic culture um, to, to flourish. Um, and I uh, really welcome um, the, the Me TU campaign uh, and obviously you know um, the testimonies from, from Claire and Maggie uh, which set it all off thanks to, to Real News uh, for being the provider to, to get all this um, out there. Thanks to Sarah Willey who's the, the main General Secretary, main women, women leader in our movement who's really behind this campaign. Um, also welcome the fact that the TUC um, have, have set, you know, th have, have given recognition um, that this is a wider issue, that this is an issue um, in all trade unions. And I actually think that, you know, the new General Secretaries went a bit further uh, than, than the previous um, General Secretary in terms of um, denouncing um, the Kennedy Report um, and the cultures within our um, unions. Um, and, and also pleased to see our assist the Assistant General Secretary Kate Bell who's here as well as Kutsia from um, the, the National Equalities Department who we had a very uh, productive discussion with um, the other day and, and is very um, supportive. Um, so I'd like to thank the TUC um, for that and I look forward to, to finding out when we can get this um, roundtable discussion um, uh, going which um, Paul um, has committed uh, to setting up. Uh, uh, with our uh, cells and hopefully influencing um, the agenda on that. Um, but um, um, one of the things um, you know, I'd like to, I'd also like to thank the the, the London and South East uh, Women's Rights Committee for for inviting us along to this meeting. Also, this is the second uh, official invite that Me to You has had uh, at an official uh, trade union event. The other being the Manchester uh, Trades Council. Uh, and I think it would be really good to see uh, if we could have more uh, speakers from uh, Me To You and, and Women in Focus uh, uh, along to official, um, along to official um, meetings. Um, because I think that, you know, uh, whilst there have been these uh, reports have been carried out, the, the reading is, is difficult, the recommendations um, are very um, robust. I don't think anyone uh, is convinced uh, that they said the 27 recommendations uh, outlined in the Monaghan report have actually been um, implemented. I think it's really important if we are serious about getting our own houses in order that we have to we have to uh, you know uh, be viewing this uh, with mm -hmm. a with a level of, of honesty. You know, despite how how difficult that may be. Um, I think that you know just just citing one example, uh, the the latest labour research. Uh, magazine, which is a fantastic magazine, by the way, it's something that I read religiously as a, a full-time officer in the union. It's it's um, invaluable, um, but it says um, setting our own houses in order, following hard-hitting investigations, uncovering sexual harassment within the trade union movement. Unions are making moves to remedy the situation. If anybody in this room can come forward and, and let me know which unions they are, uh, I'd be really um, grateful. And then the, the article then goes on to, to, to talk about what they're what, what they're doing, uh, and it describes that you know it reports on the fact that there was a, another investigation carried out in the Royal College of Nursing, uh, and obviously as well the, the TSC Kennedy report. And at the end of the paragraph, it says these three unions are either acting on the findings of the reports or have signalled their intentions um, to do so. Now the reason why the reason why I point that out. Um, is because I, I don't think that's um, completely accurate. Uh, in the GMB, uh, there's now a 30% uh, uh, pay gap between uh, women and men in that organisation, which has increased by a percent, half a percentage point since the Monaghan um, report. Uh, the, the task force that was set up, our understanding, um, is that that task, task force doesn't meet anymore, that most of the people on that task force have given up. And if you look on the website, the last report from that, uh, from the, the, the recommendations was from September 2021. We also know as well in one region in the past six months, there has been three women uh, officers uh, who have been um, pushed out of the union in one region. That's just in one region. Two of them have taken a, 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 have taken a pay off on a non-disclosure um, agreement, but one uh, is refusing to be paid off. Now she's just had her appeal, we've looked at her case 
and I can assure you that it's, you know, it is, you know, once this comes out, and there'll be more to come out on this, she has not had a fair process as a minimum. Um, and also, uh, you know, she's got a very good case um, at ET. Now, uh, the thing is, is that, you know, she shouldn't have to, to go to, to, to ET. And obviously, I can't really disclose uh, much um, at this stage. But the, the, the outcome of that appeal is, is coming imminently. Um, and, you know, our intention will be after that is to discuss, you know, how we get uh, this um, out there. Um, uh, and to ensure um, that we're exposing um, what's going on because I think that's a very necessary part of the process here and, and obviously Claire uh, has demonstrated that in terms of TSSA and off the back of that as well we've seen a number of more women and sisters uh, coming forward and, and hopefully we'll see um, more <laughs> um, and this isn't an exercise uh, in, in spite, out of spite or or you know, as being annoyed with unions as employers because we're you know one of the one of the things that's uh, went round about me to you is that we're a bunch of bitter ex trots apparently. Um, I think that nothing can be further from the truth. I think we're on the side uh, of right, and this is about you know justice, not not only for uh, the the survivors and the victims uh, uh, and the workers and and the reps who have to go through this, but this is justice. Uh, for, for our uh, unions um, and this is a question of accountability and governance you know where are the national executive committees in all of this the national executive committees of trade unions are supposed to be the bodies that oversee the running uh, of their trade unions now we keep hearing all the time from uh, lay reps so, uh, there's a staffing issue it's nothing to do it's nothing to do with uh, the lay reps well hang on who pays for the staff? Who, who, you know, it's members' money we're talking about here. Uh, and I think a really important part of this process um, is for trade union members and reps to be thinking about these questions. You know, how much money is, is your trade union paying out on, on non-disclosure agreements? Why? Why is that happening? What's the NEC doing about it? You know. Uh, what's the level of sickness absences? I, I'll guarantee you the long-term sickness absence rates of debates will be higher amongst women than it is um, in men. And, and, and you know, we're, we're sort of allowing these poor employment practices um, to continue to continue on. Um, you know, uh, we're not allowing it, um, but but this is this is continuing to, to go on. When really we should be talking about you know reclaiming um, our. Uh, unions. I mean, one of the most worrying aspects to all of this, as well as the fact that you know how many people knew about Manuel Cortes mm -hmm. for such a long mm -hmm. period of time. The amount of people who said, to me, "Oh yeah, we knew he was like that," but what did you do about it? You know, none of them. Uh, you know, nothing was done about it. Um, and, and and crucially, as well, I think that you know we, we've got a process in our unions now as well, where full-time officers are divorced from the lay reps. We should be working far more closely with our lay reps um, and members. You know, we shouldn't be there to be, you know, dive bombed into a branch to tell them what to do. You know, we should be really thinking about what what type of resources do we want for our unions. You know, if we've got working class, confident, competent uh, women full time officials, you know, that's going to attract uh, new people into our uh, movement. That's going to attract. The, the younger the younger members that we so desperately need um, into um, our movement. So I think it's very important, uh, you know, that we look at uh, the governance um, issue and, and accountability um, uh, and all of that uh, and, and what our money um, is being um, spent on. So you know we keep going, uh, you know we, we, we keep up um, the movement. As Sarah said, uh, we're only at the we're only at the start, but. But let's use this as an opportunity um, as well. You know, let's fight for accountability and proper governance in our trade unions. You know, we need to be really fighting fit. Uh, you know, for for the future in terms of the battles um, ahead, we must demand and create a safe space for survivors to come forward. Their concerns are taken seriously, and action is is, is taken if need be, um, and with no repercussions. Um, and we need this now. You know. We can't be waiting for you know as you know as 
as, as welcome as it is to have you know a, a helpline for, for, for members and all of that as well you know we need to be thinking about now where is the space where women can come forward there's no repercussions they will be believed and we talk about what action um, needs to be to be taken there you know underpinning all of that you know is, is lay members you know taking more control over uh, what happens in terms of the government governance in their unions and we also need uh, truly independent uh, staff trade unions uh, for the workers who work for these unions um, and, and more you know more solidarity um, amongst uh, you know brothers and sisters um, who work with each other so yeah thanks very much